In 15 minutes, songs of praise ring out on the west coast of Ireland in Ballinar, County Mayo. But first, the news with Moira Stewart. The headlines this evening. The battle for the Afghan city of Jalalabad has seen its fiercest fighting yet. Thousands of civilians have been forced to leave. The Prince and Princess of Wales arrive in Kuwait. It's hoped the Rushdie affair won't mar the visit. And 70 British troops join the UN in Namibia to supervise the elections for independence from South Africa. Good evening. Afghan army commanders say they've repelled a major rebel offensive after the heaviest fighting in nine years of civil war. They say they've killed 2,000 Mujahideen in the latest fighting. But they admit that the rebels surrounding the strategic provincial capital of Jalalabad have fired 3,000 artillery shells at the city in the last 24 hours. The rebels themselves say they're tightening their siege and getting ready to launch a new assault. The fighting for Jalalabad has already become the bloodiest battle of the war in Afghanistan. The Mujahideen claim that they've killed 300 Afghan army troops and have lost only 15 men themselves. The Afghan government says it's killed 2,000 guerrillas during this week's battle. The two sides may differ on the casualties, but there's no doubt the city is under heavy siege. Reinforcements have been rushed in from the capital Kabul and one garrison on the city's outskirts has already fallen to the guerrillas. Jalalabad is the fifth largest city in the country and it's seen by the Mujahideen as the key to Kabul, which is just 75 miles to the west. If Jalalabad falls, the Mujahideen's momentum may be unstoppable. On Friday, the provisional Mujahideen government held its first cabinet meeting inside Afghanistan. And several Arab countries have already recognized the rebel government. Meanwhile, the human cost of the fighting continues to mount. Thousands of refugees have been streaming out of Jalalabad after warnings from both sides that the final battle for the city is imminent. As many as 15,000 are thought to have fled so far. And the latest reports suggest the Mujahideen may launch what could be the decisive assault in the next 24 hours. Iran's interior minister has called for an economic boycott of Britain over the Salman Rushdie affair. Iran wants the issue raised tomorrow at a meeting of the Islamic Conference Organization in Saudi Arabia. In Kuwait, the Prince and Princess of Wales have arrived at the start of a tour of some Gulf states. Their hosts are hoping the visit won't be overshadowed by the controversy surrounding Mr. Rushdie's novel, The Satanic Verses. This visit was arranged long before most folk hereabouts had heard of the satanic verses, but the row over the book has inevitably cast its shadow over the prince and princess's stay in the Gulf. Iran is just across the water from Kuwait, and a few hours before the royals arrived, an emissary from Ayatollah Khomeini had passed through, urging the Kuwaitis to take a harder line against Mr. Rushdie and the British government. The Kuwaitis have condemned the book and its author, but not the government, and are unlikely to do so. But they can't ignore their Iranian neighbours. Britain has just had threats so far. Over the years, the Kuwaitis have had an attempt on the life of their ruler and a clutch of Iranian missiles. So in the present climate, no chances will be taken with the prince and princess's security. It may sound unthinkable that Islamic fundamentalists would try anything, but then a few weeks ago, it would have been unthinkable that there could be such an international ferrari over a book. Keith Graves, BBC News, Kuwait. Muslim protesters here have marched in several cities, calling for Salman Rushdie's novel, The Satanic Verses, to be banned. Several hundred demonstrated in Birmingham and held a rally at the Central Mosque. The organisers had appealed for extremists to stay away, and there was no violence. The protesters called for the book's publishers to be punished. They want the law of blasphemy extended to cover all religions, not just Christianity. And we've just heard that Pakistan has agreed to represent Iran's diplomatic interests in Britain after the breaking of relations between the two countries last Tuesday. 
The arrangement was made in Tehran after a meeting between the Pakistani foreign minister and his Iranian counterpart, Mr. Valiati. A group of British soldiers have arrived in Namibia to join the United Nations peacekeeping force, which will oversee Namibia's transition to independence. Namibia has been ruled by South Africa since the First World War. But for the last 23 years, SWAPO, the Southwest African People's Organization, has been fighting a guerrilla war against the South Africans. Preparations for independence will begin next month, and elections will be held in November with a view to complete independence in 1990. This report is from our Southern Africa correspondent, James Robbins. Touchdown for the gigantic C5 galaxy, a new site in Namibia, to herald a new era of independence from South African rule. The soldiers of 30th Signal Regiment are among the first UN troops to arrive. The British will provide communications for the entire multinational force, deployed in desert and bush, as the United Nations polices the South African pullout, coupled by international agreement to Cuban withdrawal from neighboring Angola. These first troop arrivals are pushing Namibia closer to independence than ever. The people of this territory are finally beginning to believe South Africa will withdraw under UN supervision. The blueberry does remind you that we're not, we're not just involved in the normal soldiering activities, we're also you know, diplomats as well in, in this particular aspect. So supporters of SWAPO, the guerrilla organization once openly backed by the UN, cannot expect favors from the troops who must police fair post-apartheid elections. The British will be following a cautious path, getting their first glimpse of Africa today, seeing their first lion, even if it was only stuffed. The signals unit are sharing a South African base for the first few weeks. The South African flag flies over Leopards Valley camp, but soon today's advance party led by Lieutenant Pipper Owens will be monitoring South Africa's pullout, a process due to be completed over the next seven months. James Robbins, BBC News, Leopards Valley, Namibia. The South African president, P.W. Water, has given his first television interview since suffering a stroke in January. President Borta spoke of his hopes for the black community in South Africa. I would like to see upliftment for them coming. I would like to see their uh, economic position uh, improved. I would like to see uh, their maintenance of good order uh, continuous. And I would like to see that we in Southern Africa in a spirit of uh, consultation. There's growing concern that there may be many more undiscovered IRA arms and explosives dumps in Britain. The Ulster Unionist MP Ken McGuinness says there's every likelihood that up to 15 dumps exist throughout the country. It's thought the IRA could be planning a renewed terrorist campaign. Scotland Yard confirmed yesterday that hundreds of prominent people had been advised on security after their names were discovered on an IRA list in December. The target list, found in a terrorist hideout in Clapham, South London, has led to increased security for hundreds of senior politicians, judges, generals and civil servants, many not normally thought to be terrorist targets. The chance discovery of the flat has not stopped the terrorists, and it's the sheer scale of the IRA operations which is now worrying police. The bomb at Mill Hill Barracks last year was the first IRA explosion in England since the Brighton bomb. They followed with the bomb at the Turnhill Barracks this year. They seem to be well prepared with good sources of explosives and arms. Semtex plastic explosive was found in a reservoir in North London last month. And in this Yorkshire field near the town of Scarborough where leading members of the government are meeting for a conservative rally this week. The interception of a large cache of arms and explosives on the Exxon on its way from Libya to Ireland was a security success, but many other weapons and bombs have got through, and police fear the terrorists are gearing up for an assault on targets in England to mark the 20th anniversary of the sending of British troops to Northern Ireland. And army bomb disposal experts have defused a 1,500-pound bomb in Northern Ireland. It had been left in a van close to an army base at Castle Derg in County Tyrone. The operation to make the bomb safe began at dawn and took most of the day. 
Wiltshire police have started inquiries after what they think is mercury, which was found in a carton of milk. A metallic substance, which was apparently injected into the carton, has been sent away for analysis. The two-pint carton was bought by a pregnant woman who drank some of the milk before noticing a metallic substance within it. The carton came from the Gateway supermarket at Luggershall near Andover. Detectives urge anyone buying milk there to be vigilant. If it is contaminated in any way, it should be evident, it should be visibly evident. If anybody's got any doubts at all as to uh, uh, whether or not their milk has been contaminated, they should contact the nearest police station. The milk was supplied to Gateways by the Salisbury Dairy Churchfields. Their managing director says he's confident none of his staff are to blame. From the time the milk is cartoned, it is put into a locked cold store, uh, and that there would be very, very little opportunity, as far as we can see, for any tampering to have occurred prior to the milk being delivered. Detectives are appealing for anyone with information to come forward. They've notified other police forces throughout the country, but so far say there's nothing to indicate who was responsible for the contamination. Football in today's only Barclays League First Division match, Aston Villa drew nil-nil with Manchester United at Villa Park. Martine Lemoynen has become Britain's first woman squash world champion after beating New Zealand's Susan Devoy in today's final. Moynan beat her rival three sets to one in the Netherlands. A trio of Great Britain's Olympic hockey gold medalists have taken another trophy as the domestic season reached its climax in London. But there was no fairy tale ending for the underdogs Bromley, who went down 2 1 to a Hounslow side laden with internationals. To have actually reached the final, Bromley had defied the pundits, and as they warmed up, there was no shortage of determination to take their cup run all the way. After all, every dog is meant to have its day, and Bromley hoped mascot Jiffy would enjoy his. But Hounslow's stick bin indicated their pedigree of three Olympic gold medalists among nine internationals. And after surviving Bromley's first half onslaught, the favourites took the lead early in the second, with John Potter feeding Martin Grimley a short corner. Three minutes later, another short corner gave Rob Thompson Hounslow's second. Bromley weren't finished though, and captain Miles Richards gave them hope with this goal. But Hounslow held out, and this win puts them into the European Cup Winners' Cup next season. That's it for now. The main news tonight is at 10 past 9. A very good evening to you. Well, it's going to be a windy night tonight. The wind's particularly strong and gusty on the western and southern side of this low. And as it tracks its way northeastwards, those strongest winds coming across the Irish Sea through by midnight and then getting right across onto the eastern side of the country by the end of the night. The wind's still 40, 45 mile an hour and gusting stronger than that, dying down a bit on the western side by the end of the night, but still fairly strong. We've got some rain working its way northwards. That's going to turn to snow as it goes over the hills from the northern Pennines northwards. Some quite nasty conditions, some quite heavy falls of snow there for a time. And although it'll be clearing away from the west, still some on the eastern side by the end of the night. But that'll be pushing into the North Sea fairly quickly tomorrow. And then a getting better day, I think a day of uh, sunshine and showers. Most of the showers up in northern and western parts and up in the north, they could be of hail, snow, sleet, just about everything you care to mention. But few and far between, I think, on the eastern side. The wind's still very strong, but gradually dying down, I think, as we go through the day. Well, that's it from me. Bye-bye for now.